The New Testament reading for today is from Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 3. You will find it in the Pew Bible, in the New Testament, uh, page 192. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and, his, and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Barbara, for our being our reader this morning very much. History sometimes reveals an odd symmetry that can frame significant events from the past. There are two clocks from two museums. Neither of them are working. Both of them, in fact, are barely legible. On one clock, time is frozen at 8.05 a.m. On the other clock, Time is frozen at 8.15 a.m. The first clock comes from the chaplain's desk of the USS Arizona, a clock frozen in the moment that a bomb from a Japanese attack dropped into the Ford magazine of the battleship with unimaginable and irreparable destruction. For many, that moment on December 7, 1941, has always represented the true beginning of World War II, which could not become a world war without America's involvement. And at that point, we were involved. The second clock is on the face of a wristwatch found in the ruins of Hiroshima, Japan, frozen the moment that the first atomic bomb was used as a weapon of war. Though the watch's hands had been blown off, the heat of the blast embossed the hand's image on the watch face at 8.15 a.m. A photo of the burned and ruined watch tells the world all it needs to know about the destruction and the death on August 6, 1945 at 8.15 a.m. when World War II basically ended, leaving in its wake the deaths of millions and the scars of a carnage that disfigures our planet to this day, to this day. Time 
is one of the great mysteries of the universe. As I just shared with our younger people, time can be easily measured with mathematical precision. But time can also be perceived by the human mind in vastly different ways. I read an interesting article about the fluidity of time, which opened with this paragraph. Humans have a fitful relationship with the clock, if modern idioms are any indication. Time flies when we're having fun. Time drags when we're bored. Sometimes time is on our side. Other times, time is racing against us. Now, in my world, the world of a pastor working in a church, weeks are measured in Sundays, literally. Months are measured in session and committee meetings, and years are measured in major religious celebrations. While Christmas always represents for me the conclusion of a year, the new year comes and immediately I start preparing for Easter. And when someone asks me, well, Mac, when are you going to re retire? I say, well, I got about five or ten more Christmases to go. <laughs> In ministry, time is very strange. It really is. But a pastor's experience is only a symptom of how time has always been understood and lived by those who believe in Jesus Christ. There are many things that have profoundly changed history. We can point to inventions like the wheel, the printing press, or in a more contemporary vein, the personal computer. We can point to historical events like the one I just mentioned a moment ago, the, the, the first atomic test which ushered in the nuclear age. But research reveals that the list of people who are considered to have irreversibly changed the world are very few. And the list itself, as we know, is always subject to dispute and controversy. Of course, Jesus of Nazareth is on all of those lists. Many times at the top, number one. But at least always near the top, in the top five, almost always. But for we who believe in Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah sent by the God in whom we also believe, the profound and eternal change in time that Jesus inaugurated is not to be found in the disciplines of religion or history or psychology or sociology, or on some top ten list, but in our hearts, within us. And in how our hearts understand the meaning of our lives as they apply to time. The early Christian church understood this new experience of time and life and the universe. But putting that understanding into words was in the hands of the early church leaders, such as the Apostle Paul. And it was, let me assure you, a difficult task. How do you explain eternity? How do you explain living in the eternity now? Paul reaches into the depth of this new reality in the opening of his letter to the Christians in Ephesus. And while we translate that opening 
into 14 specific verses, as we did this morning. In the Greek of Paul's time, it is written in one long, artfully written sentence. And it is truly, at least from a theological point of view, one of the most significant sentences in all the Bible. It expresses the heart of what it means to be a Christian. The circumstances of Paul's eloquent and remarkable opening statement in Ephesians, which, by the way, is really, is really a sermon, was rooted in the identity crisis that took place in the early Christian church. Not just in the church of Ephesus, the church to which Paul was writing, but in all of those fledgling churches throughout the known world at that time, particularly the Roman Empire. Those early Christians had become discouraged and distracted by the task and the trials of living in the bloody and seemingly endless struggles of human history, represented in their time, as we know, by the evil of the Roman Empire, also represented by the oppression and anger of the synagogues against the church and the damaging influence upon the church of the pagan cults. For these Christians, their expectations of the coming of God's Messiah had been dimmed by the reality of their lives and the new hardships that their faith had engendered. The expectations of the Ephesians and their fellow Christians was that Jesus in his death and resurrection would inaugurate a new age for the world an age of peace and spiritual fulfillment in which God's Messiah would rule the world in real time. But that's not what happened, is it? In fact, some of them, some of the, the, the Christians at that time were very discouraged and expressed their discouragement to Paul because it felt like nothing had changed. Nothing had changed in the world, although they had changed tremendously. To me, their attitude reflects the nihilistic words of, that William Shakespeare wrote in his great play, Macbeth. You've heard these words before, probably. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Paul's counter to the pessimism of those early Christians is to tell them that things really have changed, really have changed, with the coming of the Messiah. Not just in their lives, but in human history, in all creation, and in the very nature of existence and time itself. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, where? In the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ, when? Before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless, blameless before him in love. God destined us for adoption, 
as God's children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. That's Jesus, the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan, a plan, for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? That's a lot to think about. Paul declared to the Ephesians that in Christ all things have been unified not just in their lives as believers, but in the nature of existence itself. Paul declared that their unity with Christ and in Christ and for Christ was a transcendent unity, beginning even before creation, when the Ephesian believers were chosen before the foundation of the world to bring the love of Christ into the world. Not only did God the Father choose believers before creation to live holy and blameless lives in the eternal presence of Christ, but their chosenness has a purpose in time and in space. Not space up there. Space right here the space we occupy and share with the world. Believers, according to Paul, have been given a destiny. Now here's where Paul separates Christianity from every other religion of his day. At best, at that time, human life was lived at the whim of forces beyond the control of humanity. The gods or fate or the one God provided no benefit or purpose for life beyond creation itself. At best, humanity existed for little more than obedience to the law of an unknowable and unreachable creator. The only thing that humanity could say for sure about its existence was in recognition of its own limited participation in life and in time. Humans were born, they lived, and they died. Pretty much, that was it. Paul, however, presents faith in Christ as the embracing of a purpose that transcends life and death. Paul declares that believers are intentionally born into meaningful lives in which every part of that life, good and bad, is lived for one purpose to the glory of Christ. Paul declares that the glory of Christ of which he speaks is unlimited and unbounded. And since we live, we who believe, for the sake of that glory, we too are unlimited and unbounded by the whim of fate or the tyranny of history and humanity. In Christ, we are made free. 
With our freedom from a decaying universe comes a great gift, according to Paul, given freely to those who believe in Christ. Redemption. As one of my commentaries put it, the good news of Jesus Christ affects a rescue operation, a deliverance from spiritual death, from God's wrath, from bondage to evil and sin in the flesh. Paul emphasized that we have done nothing to earn this rescue. Even belief itself, our belief, has been a gift given to us by God for God's purposes, which we may know or feel we know or may be a total mystery to us. But, they are the, but God's purpose continues. Now, Paul knew that this would be a hard concept for his readers to understand as it is a hard concept for us to understand especially in a world in which one only gained advance by doing rather than by just being but Paul explained that just the existence of the Christian church, of Christianity, declared the mystery of God's will. What is that mystery? That in Christ, God has revealed a plan for all time. A plan that ends with the eternal unity of all things in Christ. Heaven and earth, the creator and the created, Yesterday, today, and forever. For Paul, all time is now. And that is the reality in which all believers live. But what does that mean? All time is now. Sounds nice. Well, to live in the now of God's purpose is to set aside all that is distracting to that purpose and embrace the only existence that matters to those who believe. A life lived in and a life lived for. The love of our Savior. Writer Anne Lamott, Presbyterian writer Anne Lamott, put it best in one of her many wry observations about her self-centered spiritual struggles. This is what she wrote. Again and again, I tell God I need help. And God says, well, isn't that fabulous? Because I need help too. So you go get that old woman over there some water. And I'll figure out what we're going to do about your stuff. Paul declares to the Ephesians that they have new stuff for which to live their lives. New stuff of the Spirit that Paul calls our inheritance. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we might live for the praise of his glory. In him you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. We will recall that in Christ's parable of the prodigal son, do you remember the story? The son demands his inheritance be given to him immediately 
instead of waiting for the death of his father. And so his father, out of love, says, fine. The son then goes out and spends himself into poverty, using, using up all of the inheritance that he received. Paul tells the believers in Ephesus that the inheritance they have received through Christ cannot be spent out and that the benefits of the age to come, eternal life in the kingdom of God has become a present heavenly reality for all believers. It is through the presence of the Holy Spirit that we receive these benefits. The Spirit keeps each moment of our lives in the presence of the eternal God and in the unending love of Jesus Christ. Our joys, our tears, our pains, our comforts, our failures, and our achievements are all to the glory of God. A glory which destroys the tyranny of the past, which destroys the hopelessness of the present, which destroys the fear of the future. And that enables us to live our lives in the now. Whatever we experience. Just as the two clocks of World War II showed us the framework of an age of death and destruction. The life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ revealed the framework in which we live as believers. Not of death or destruction, but of life and purpose. A framework of eternal love a framework of promise. You may be familiar with at least part of the serenity prayer written by the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. And we are familiar with that part of it. It's very well known. But the full serenity prayer, as written, beautifully describes the life of those who live in the now, in the timeless reality of God's love. Let this prayer be our prayer. Let this prayer be our way of life. Do you remember it? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Our time is now. What are we doing today, this moment, for our Lord Jesus Christ? A moment that will last for an eternity. Amen. So our hymn of, the, of our sermon this morning is one of the most powerful hymns of our Christian faith. 
We will stand and we will sing together number 649 in your hymnal, or you'll see the, you probably know the, the stanzas of Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let us stand together.